Good morning, pastors. Even though I could not be with you in person today, I wanted to bring a word of greeting. I know from personal experience that a pastoral move can bring a lot of angst as well as uncertainty. As your bishop, I want you to know that I understand that you may be grieving. You are saying goodbye to people you have baptized, confirmed, prayed with, and served with. You have presided at funerals and weddings and undertaken new and exciting ministries together. I know it is hard to say goodbye, but God has something new and great in store for those churches and for you. Today's event with Reverend Jim Osier will focus on how God is working in this time of transition. God has prepared this moment for you to bring your gifts and talents to new churches and has prepared someone else to lead the churches you are leaving, building on the ministries you have done. See, I believe the Holy Spirit is working in our appointment process and that every pastoral move offers an opportunity to build and strengthen the kingdom. Thank you for saying yes, yes to the call to go as Abram and Sarah did long ago when they left their home and followed God's call to a new land of blessing and promise. I want you to know that I am praying for you as you prepare to move, and I am eager to see where God is leading you and the churches you will serve. Let us pray. Almighty God, I thank you, Lord, for our clergy in the Virginia Annual Conference. And I thank you for the clergy that we have projected to move to new appointments. I pray, God, for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to be in them and to speak through them. I pray, God, that as they transition into these new churches, God, that there will be an excitement, an excitement of possibilities. Because, God, we know that with you, all things are possible. God, I also pray for their families as they are also making the transition. And God, we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim, for joining us and, and leading us through this this evening. Well, I appreciate it so much. I'm Jim Osier. And, uh, I'll be, uh, I'll be uh, leading the session tonight. And um, uh, to tell you, uh, uh, hosting uh, uh, and, and helping me out will be Jim Chandler. Jim Wave. So uh, many of you know Jim. He is actually uh, from Virginia. And um, uh, so, uh, uh, and Jim is an excellent coach and has, helps churches in many ways not just in Virginia, but around the country as, uh, as uh, we work together. And then I have a couple of uh, 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 guests. I'm not sure uh, if they're both on yet, but uh, I'd like to just let you know uh, um, that uh, uh, Thibodeau, just uh, a wave, Yvette, if you would there, so people can see you. So uh, Yvette is uh, going through a pastoral uh, transition as a clergy spouse. Um, her husband has uh, just become the lead pastor of Impact Church in Atlanta, and, um, uh, and Yvette brings uh, a, world, a wealth of very successful knowledge from the corporate world as a consultant, and um, she, uh, I've known her for a while, and uh, she's kind of exploring what we do in, in the Difference Makers group, and, and uh, possibly will be, uh, will be joining our team, so we're really excited about that, and um, uh, the same with uh, Brad Calajana. I, I don't I don't know if Brad is on yet. Uh, Brad just recently retired as a, a pastor, a founding pastor and long tenured pastor in Michigan, who grew one of Methodism's largest churches there, multi-site campus. And uh, Brad's recently retired. Is now in Wisconsin, but uh, he coaches with us and consults with us. And so I just wanted to let you know that they're on this evening. Uh, just to uh, to kind of observe how we do uh, how we do the workshop. So you're here for the changeover zone. You're all what we call in the changeover zone because you're receiving a new pastor. You're saying goodbye, in most cases, and hello to uh, to a new pastor. So um, the changeover zone is language that we uh, that we use from uh, the world of uh, track and field. 
from a relay race. And uh, in a relay race, those multiple lanes where the runners uh, exchange the baton, is all, th those lanes are often called the changeover zone. Now in a track meet, the changeover zone is uh, distance. It's about 20 meters and a good runner, she can run those 20 meters in seven steps. And so we build our work on seven steps on how to have a great uh, pastoral transition. Now in the church world, it's not distance, rather it's a uh, time. And now ideally the changeover zone in a church world ideally starts about a hundred days before the appointment and goes 100 days after the appointment begins. But uh, the timing is such that we don't have 100 days here in the Virginia Conference. We have uh, 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 just a little over 46 days or so. I 46 think. days. So, uh, so, but we don't want to waste those days. So tonight, uh, fasten your seat belts and, and hang on because we're going to cover a lot of material. This workshop is really designed for an all day event. But we're going to compress the uh, the main points here in uh, in these next ninety minutes. Now, as we get started, uh, let me just say, uh, forgive us in advance if anything that Jim or I say tonight makes it sound like we think we know more about your church and your situation and your conference uh, than you do. We don't. Here's our hope that in these 90 minutes, uh, our experience working with hundreds of churches, many just like yours, and your experience of being your church today, coming out of COVID, dealing with denominational uncertainty, being a, being, living through and wading through the social unrest that is all around us, that you, our experience together will uh, be able to have us have a great moving forward to say goodbye in a, in a wonderful way and hello in a really uh, great way. Now, we work across uh, many conferences, and so uh, protocols and conferences are a little bit different. So please, my friends, um, if we say anything, suggest anything that seems to go uh, different or not be aligned with what your DS or your conference protocols happen to be, go with your DS. She or he knows more about you than we could possibly know. Now there's good news because we work uh, all over and we're doing this in an hour and a half tonight, we're gonna have to paint in pretty broad strokes. So uh, Dwayne has arranged for this. So for you who are registered here for every church, you are entitled to one uh, gratis uh, follow-up uh, hour-long consultation so that uh, one of my team members or me, we can help you make very specific what we're teaching to your unique setting and situation. And we'll be telling you more, uh, more about that. And I'm hey, Jim. Sure. Yes. Yep. Yeah. If I could just interrupt there, because um, there may be people who are like me that anytime I hear something like a free hour long consultation, I think of experiences that uh, I had uh, going to some resort and then had to sit through some timeshare sales pitch. Uh, we do work as coaches and consultants, but uh, that one hour, if you take advantage of that, uh, it is not about us uh, trying to sell you or upsell you on anything. It really is sincerely uh, to take what we're going to be talking about tonight and uh, help it uh, be really specific to your church. Isn't he just the nicest guy in the world? You're so lucky to have him in Virginia, I'll tell you what. So, but hey, but don't be fooled. I know he when he gets on his Harley and he wears that helmet, then he's a monster. So. Uh, but you'll enjoy what he has to share with us uh, uh, this evening. Now, uh, uh, if, if you'll, we're also so aware, aren't you, that while what we're doing is very important tonight, very important all around us throughout the world and in our own country, there are other things that are so very important. And let's keep those in mind that, um, uh, you know, the, that there's so much going on right now. And we are very much aware that that you are here uh, wearing uh, uh, at least four different hats. You all are wearing the hat of saying goodbye. Now, we can never know your particular situation. 
my friends, some of you may be here uh, in, in grief and agony about saying goodbye to a pastor whom you have loved so much, who perhaps has uh, uh, buried your family members, um, baptized your children and grandchildren. I mean, some of you are just in such grief. There may be others of you here who are saying, finally, we got rid of that pastor. We're now, we, you know, I mean, we just don't know. So, but whatever your situation, uh, you, we want to be saying goodbye in a great way. And you're wearing the hat of saying hello uh, to a new pastor whom you probably do not know. Uh, and you're wearing the hat also of being church leaders for a time when it's the craziest time of being the church coming out of COVID, hopefully. And we know that's impacted your churches and your, your spirit and your morale. And dealing with, of course, as we say, denominational uncertainty and other social uncertainties. So we like to say um, our hat is off to you. Thank you. Uh, you all do this for free. You don't get paid to be a church lay person, lay leader. You put hours of your heart and your time. And uh, it inspires us because I can tell you without you good folks, the church just doesn't work. So um, I mentioned that track meet. In a track meet, there are four main players that work together to create a great passing of the baton. There's the runner with the baton, the runner who's going to receive the baton, the on-the-field coach. And when we spoke to track coaches, they explained to us the fourth party is perhaps the most important one. It's the crowd. It's people cheering and supporting. It's parents sometimes running alongside their runner in the track meet. It's the grandparents and moms and dads and, and friends who pack up the cooler and bring the Gatorade and all that kind of stuff. When these four parties work in good relationship, you can have a great passing of the baton. In the church world, the four main players are these. The runner with the baton, that's your current pastor. And we had a chance yesterday to meet with all of your pastors for a training, and you are so fortunate to have some just wonderful pastoral leadership. There's the runner who's going to receive the baton, the, the new pastor that's coming. There's the on-the-field coach who is your district superintendent, and your conference has asked Jim and I to help with that coaching. And that fourth main party is you, the church. So if you look at the front of your workbook, you'll see this is the local church version of the workbook that we're going to be going through tonight. It's a fill in the blank. Relax. If you miss one or if we run short of time or we go a different direction, we'll be giving all the answers to Dwayne and he can get them to you after the uh, workshop. So yesterday, we used a different workbook to teach the role of the pastors saying goodbye to their church and hello to a new church. And earlier, I had the opportunity to meet with your uh, cabinet, your bishop, and your district superintendents. So uh, this is, we're focusing tonight on your role as, as local church leaders. All right, everybody got, am I making sense where we're going? Now, before I jump into this, we love to just kind of set the stage, and uh, we, we, we love this commercial. You will remember it. It was out a few years ago, but it's so daggone funny and speaks so clearly to what we want to address this evening. Take a look. Whoa. Father, why can't we have direct TV like the McGregors do? We're settlers, son. We settle for things, like having cable instead of direct TV. Hey, Jebediah, how's it going? Working the land, hoping for a fertile spring. All right. So we have to live with lower customer satisfaction? I'm afraid so. Now, go churn us some butter, boy, and then make your own clothes. Yes, sir. Don't be a settler. Yeah. Get rid of cable and upgrade to direct TV. Now, come on, that's funny. Now, we're not asking you to upgrade to cable TV, but we hope that you're here this evening because you are willing to up your game. To say we are, don't have to settle for just having a pastoral transition like we have for decades, that we can leverage this unique opportunity to actually grow our church, to create a different culture, a different spirit. So what Jim and I are all about, we're, we're, we, we will help churches grow. And our experience is that a church has very few better opportunities to grow than when there's a pastoral change 
done well. So for us, we have a definition for having a great passing of the baton. If churches won't settle, if you'll up your game, we're going to share with you very specific, not just principles, but tools and techniques that you can apply starting this week to have a great passing of the baton. Now, our definition of a, passing, of a great passing of the baton is this. Friends, if you happen to have a first-time guest or a return guest, come to the church anytime during the changeover zone. That's the next six weeks for you and then the first hundred days afterwards. That first-time guest may not know anything about your church. You never know why a first-time guest comes. They may be new to the area and church shopping. More likely, they're there because they've had some life crisis and they're looking for spiritual help. Or maybe a neighbor's baby is being baptized. We just don't know. But friends, whatever brings a first-time guest to your church while you're in the changeover zone, we want them saying to themselves as they walk away, these are the kind of people I could hang out with. Because that's how churches grow today. So our, pre our process is equipping a church to create a culture of growth during these days by putting a lot of focus and attention on this. So, um, it, so it, uh, let's go now. We're on page three, if you follow along in the workbook, as I mentioned. Uh, number three, you're, the changeover zones the 100 days before the appointment begins number, and the 100 days after it begins. We only have uh, a portion of those days beginning, but we've got all 100 for the uh, after the appointment begins, and we'll want to spend a lot of time on that. And our hope is tonight to share not just the role transference, but if you're filling in the blanks, the relational transference. How do we transfer the relational capital that your pastor has built up to her or his successor? Now, the changeover zone depends that onboarding, that after the pastor gets there, be, depending on what kind of church that you're in, and we just, we don't know. But for instance, if any of you happen to be here this evening and you're in a new church start and you're receiving your first appointment of a new church, that changeover zone is going to be longer because uh, there's just some specific things to work on. If you happen to be in a church where uh, you are losing a pastor, your pastor is leaving because uh, she or he is retiring uh, or because uh, they have been there for uh, many, many years and you're receiving a new pastor, that changeover zone is going to be a bit longer. And that's the advantage of following up with the consultation. So I don't know what your unique situation is. You may be here tonight and you may be in a church that is falling apart. That's running out of money. It's running out of people. It's running out of energy and enthusiasm. And so that changeover zone is going to be a little bit longer. So but let us help you walk through that. So, uh, and we have in Virginia, we have a couple of uh, churches. I don't know if, you're, if the congregations are here where you're having what, what we call planned succession, where uh, an, a beloved associate is gonna move up to become the senior pastor in a planned succession. So the length of time just depends uh, on what kind of transition that you, uh, that you are having. Okay, now friends, uh, I'll turn the page to page four. We're gonna cover all each of these items in detail, but I just wanna be sure what you've communicated. There are five, critical things that you can do if you're the SPRC chair or if you are uh, on the SPRC committee or you're the leadership of your church, five things that you can do starting right now that can help make that kind of a great passing of the baton where a first time guest would say, these are the kind of people I can hang out with. Number one is this, your attitude. So again, I don't know what kind of situation you're having in your church. There's so many things we can't control, right? None of us can control COVID. None of us have much control over what's going to happen with our denomination. Very few of us have much control over who our new pastor is going to be. There's so much we can't control, but each one of us can control the most important thing, our attitude. So be sure your attitude is positive. Now, I know it's been a tough time in the life of the church, but I want to ask you to be positive. Actually, I want to ask you right now just to look at me on behalf of the bishop. I hope that you'll make a covenant together with each other, with me, that 
not one negative word after tonight about the bishop, about the DS, about the church, about your pastor, not one negative word. Because as a leader, your word, when it gets repeated, becomes a negative sentence. And when it gets repeated, it becomes a negative paragraph. And when it gets repeated, it becomes a negative page. And when it gets repeated, it becomes, you got the idea? If leaders are starting to act a negative, then my friends, the narrative of your church and your community will become, that's a place of complaining negative people. And as consultants, we can tell you the number one thing that any church can do to grow is for people to covenant together to have a positive attitude. If a first time guest walks into your church, they don't know anything about you, but they have a radar. And if they see folks huddled up, you know, yin yang in, they can just sense a spirit of negativity and complaining. And no first time guest will be a second time guest. Amen? Can I get a thumbs up? Not a negative word. Now, that doesn't mean you might not have legitimate issues and concerns, but don't be sharing them with your people in your church. That's where you'd call Dwayne or your DS or call us or something like that. Secondly, make sure your attitude is overcoming. Friends, right now, uh, it is so tempting to be victims of the things we can't control. And when we become victims, we become angry. This has been a tough, tough time in the life of the church. But I, I, I commend to you, you can Google this and see it. I've actually had the chance to go to the little town of Enterprise, Alabama. And there is the monument to the boll weevil. It's a, it's a fun deal. You can, like I say, you can Google it. And, and what happened is uh, uh, cotton was king in the, all that part of the world. And when the boll weevil came and killed the cotton crop, churches closed. Towns folded up. Businesses left. People thought this is the worst thing that could ever happen. But through God's grace, the folks learned how to farm in new ways, in different ways, and plant different crops. And they became more prosperous than ever. And so the citizens erected a monument to the bull weevil. And at its base, it reads like this. If you Google, you'll see it. What we thought was the worst thing that could ever happen turned out to be the best thing. That is the spirit of overcoming. My friends, let's don't be victims. No matter what's going on, we believe in a God who overcomes, right? And so we have to be the ones that live that out, your attitude. Secondly, um, we're going to ask you to develop an action plan tonight. And now Jim's going to lead you through that in just a moment. But this action plan is what we hope will make you be intentional. Because uh, the single most important word in any great passing of baton is intentionality. So we hope by tonight, it, now we're going to share with you things that we know work around the country. But you may say, that'll never work in our church. Well, you're, you're probably right. Don't do it then. But do something else. Be intentional. And we hope we inspire your intentionality and your creativity. Number three, if you haven't done this yet, our experience is it's best to put together a transition team. Now, some churches have the SPRC committee do everything about the saying goodbye and saying hello. If that's what it has to be for you, we understand. Do it and do it well. But you'll get a lot more mileage if you'll establish a transition team, the short-term time for volunteers. If you have staff, even if they're part-time, a transition team often consists of a staff member or two. It will consist of a member or two of your SPRC committee, your staff parish relations committee, and a couple of other influencers in the church that you just know have a love for the church. And when you're looking at those influencers, look for people who are good with actually getting things done, detailed people. Because when we put together your action plan, as one section of it's going to be specific plans, and we want to have a team that's going to make sure all those plans get carried out. The fourth thing is now, we want you to start now to introduce your new pastor to your congregation. Now, we have asked all your pastors, we met with them, to prepare a short biographical video that they can send to you, the SBRC chair. And if you get it to your tech people, you'll be able to show it. Now, here's a sample of one 
uh, that we showed your pastors, and this happens to be a, a young pastor in Virginia. Take a look. Hello there, Blacksburg United Methodist Church, both the Church Street and Edges campuses. My name is Mandy Newman, and I will be heading your direction in late June to be the site pastor out at Edges. I'm super excited to be coming your way and can't wait to um, share in this wonderful journey of faith uh, together with you guys. Um, I am an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. I'm a wife of 27 years. I'm a mom of two kids. I do yoga, but not very well. I play the piano, but usually not for people. I love to read and go to movies and to hang out outdoors with people. But most of all, I love Jesus. And I love to share the love that Jesus has for all people with others and to be in a community, to be a part of a community where we can ask questions and learn together and figure out how we might live our faith um, in this sometimes crazy world. Um, please know that I have been praying for you all and will continue to do so and I invite you to also pray for me. I understand we'll be sharing a few of these video clips in the coming months and I look forward to doing that and I can't wait to hear and hear all your stories and meet you guys. So um, in the meantime, may the grace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, wasn't that just a sweet, simple video? Even if you, uh, most of our churches have screens and use screens in worship, if yours does not, you can still use these videos to put on your website. But the great advantage of showing them on screens is that first time guest gets to see them, the person who may not go to the website. So we really encourage you to make, uh, make room in your schedule that Jim's getting ready to lay out for you to have at least one introductory video, maybe a couple of videos of your new pastor. Now I want to be, am I making sense what I'm saying, whether you agree or not, am I making sense? Thumbs up so I can know if I'm making sense. Thank you. Now the last thing so far, what we've been talking about are the inboarding parts of a pastoral transition, getting to know your new pastor before she or he arrives. I'm going to spend more time talking about ways to say goodbye to your, uh, your current pastor. The last thing we want to work on today is uh, number five, planning the listening tour. And we'll be, uh, the rest of our time, we're gonna detail each of these five areas in more uh, specifics. So it's time now to start planning the listening tour. You plan it now over the next uh, four or five weeks. And when your new pastor arrives, your new pastor is the one who goes on the listening tour. But we don't want your new pastor planning her or his own listening tour. We want it planned in advance before, before they arrive. And the listening tour is a great opportunity. It's designed not for you to listen to your pastor. You'll have many opportunities to hear from your new pastor. It's designed for your new pastor to get to listen to you, to learn your story, your culture, your history. All right, making sense? Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, pass this baton over to Jim and, and let him uh, lead you through the specifics here now. Okay, if uh, you will look on, on page five in your workbook, and uh, this is uh, the changeover zone action plan uh, quadrant, and we're going to walk uh, through this. But before we begin, uh, that word that Jim mentioned earlier I'm gonna invite you to write that at the top of this page. It is the word intentionality, intentionality, uh, because uh, we do have 46 days uh, before your uh, pastor's uh, first Sunday. Uh, we have um, six Sundays between now and then. And then you've got those hundred days on the other side of your pastor arriving. And folks, those days are gonna come and go uh, whether we're intentional about doing anything or not. But we want to make sure that we make the absolute best we can uh, of those 46 days before uh, your pastor arrives and those 100 days after uh, they arrive. And this uh, action plan quadrant uh, can be really, really helpful to you. And I invite you to start using it tonight. Um, and as we go through the remainder of this workshop uh, to jot things down, uh, and on this action plan quadrant. And then uh, after this, uh, if you're not the staff parish chairperson in your church, 
Uh, just get your uh, quadrant to them so that they can have them from everybody who's participating um, in this training, and then they can compile those. Uh, but let's just walk uh, through this, and let's start in the upper left-hand corner with challenges. And you know, there's some challenges that uh, every church is facing now. Um, you know, we're uh, all dealing uh, with uh, COVID. We hope that we're coming out of it, you know, but we're still dealing uh, with uh, uh, with this pandemic. Uh, we're all dealing uh, with denominational uncertainty. Uh, we're all dealing uh, with uh, a lot of social division and social unrest in, in our culture. Uh, there are some challenges that are pretty much universal to uh, you know, all churches uh, now, uh, but there are some challenges that are specific to your church. And you know, I can't possibly know what those challenges would be for your church, but you know. And so I really invite you to uh, be very specific, to write down you know, what are the challenges that you're facing uh, in this uh, changeover zone time period. And this is not to be pessimistic, uh, but it is to be uh, honest and realistic because our experience has been, and uh, we probably all know this from our own lives, you know, if we uh, ignore those challenges, uh, they're going to come back to bite us. So, you know, be really specific about the challenges that you're uh, facing. If you move down to the lower left quadrant, uh, this is about goals. And what specific goals do you think your church should have during this changeover zone? And they're going to be different based on the circumstances in your church. You know, it may be that you've had a really great run. Uh, you've had a lot of momentum, and now you're uh, going to have a, a change in pastors. And so your goal might be, hey, we want to make sure that we build on the momentum that we already have. Uh, it may be the, the circumstance where, you know, things have not gone well. And, um, you know, the, the goal that, that you may have is, hey, we need to stop the bleeding. We need to make sure uh, that we turn this around. We can't possibly know the specifics of all the churches represented uh, on our call tonight, but you know what uh, those uh, goals are. So again, be really specific and uh, write those down. Uh, you, know, you can do it now and as they occur to you as we go through the uh, remainder of our time together tonight. And then in the uh, upper right uh, quadrant, uh, this is opportunities. And Jim's going to be sharing uh, some specific examples of uh, opportunities uh, that uh, you know, churches have. And he said it uh, a few minutes ago, you, know, you will have uh, very few greater opportunities uh, to grow uh, than in the midst of the changeover zone when that is done well. And you know, so as you uh, are inspired by something that you see or hear tonight, as you think of an opportunity that is real for your church, jot it down in this quadrant. And then when we uh, drop down to the lower right, uh, here's where you get really specific about your plans. You know, what are you specifically going to do in this 46 days uh, and those six Sundays that you have leading up to your new pastor uh, arriving? And you know, think about your church calendar, things that are already going on in your church and in your community, and where can you tie in uh, with those? Um, and in this quadrant, I invite you to uh, draw a timeline, uh, just like the one that I have here, you know, a very simple timeline. That date in the middle is July 3rd in our, in, in our uh, annual conference. Uh, that's the new pastor's first uh, Sunday, July 3rd. Um, and so, uh, you know, and ideally, we have 100 days uh, before the uh, appointment begins. We've said it several times. We know we don't have that many days left. Uh, but please, please don't think, oh, my gosh, you know, we don't have 100 days, so we can't do anything. Um, you know, there are many, many things that you can do beginning today and over uh, these next uh, six weeks. You know, so we have uh, these six Sundays uh, before uh, July 3rd. And so, you know, be thinking about what specifically will we do on each of these uh, Sundays? Um, you just saw that example of, 
uh, Mandy's video where she was introducing herself to the church where she was being appointed. So one of these Sundays, hey, maybe we're going to show a video of uh, our new pastor. Uh, the uh, baton that we use as, as a metaphor, uh, many churches uh, will have this as a visual in their uh, sanctuaries uh, every week during that changeover zone, and they will uh, have it as a, a point of focus. Uh, you know, sometimes somebody will hold it up and talk about it, that, hey, you know, in, in three weeks, we're going to be uh, passing the baton from one pastor to another. Uh, others will you know, lay it on the altar and uh, have it a, as a point of prayer or do something special with it uh, you know, each Sunday. Uh, Jim's going to share more about some uh, specific things that you can do with that uh, metaphor, uh, but being intentional about uh, what you're going to do uh, during this uh, time of 46 uh, days. And then uh, you will all have the 100 days uh, after the uh, appointment begins. And uh, we're going to be coming back to that listening tour uh, that Jim just talked about. Uh, that's uh, one of the big things uh, that you'll be doing in that 100 days. Uh, but uh, be thinking about what other things do we want to uh, build into our our schedule, our culture, the, the, what we're doing in those days uh, to be able to, you know, say hello in a great way, but also make sure that you've got a great onboarding uh, for uh, your new pastor. Jim, anything you want to add about the uh, action plan quadrant? Hey, uh, thanks, Jim. You know, free, people frequently ask us, why do we think that the changeover zone is an ideal time and a great opportunity to grow? And we have a couple of reasons. You know, one is we see it happen. But secondly, uh, friends, for uh, these um, 146 days, there's going to be a lot of focus and attention. This is a great time. You, you have a, a compressed period of time when you can get the church excited about talking about the same kind of things. It gives you great opportunity to do some ministries that you maybe should have been doing anyhow, but now you have a real reason to do them. So we, we, we're going to focus now on those opportunities and what you can do to say goodbye and to say hello in a way that a first-time guest would say, these are the kind of people that I could hang out with. So flip over the page, please, there on page six. And uh, now we're going to talk specifically about the role of the church. So uh, are you ready? First of all, rally the troops. Uh, there's almost always uh, more anxiety and angst in a congregation when there's a change of pastoral leadership than we realize, and people will take that out differently. So first thing, if you're a leader in the church, and that's why you're here, rally the troops. So that means to be positive and to be encouraging. Now, that first bullet there says, uh, says the uh, age response ratio. I don't want to spend much time on that. That simply means if for instance, typically the younger the church, the longer the changeover zone, the longer the onboarding needs to be with more specific uh, things. So if you're a brand new church getting your first new pastor, we spend a lot of time getting that pastor onboarded. But the other side of that is uh, we have a lot of our churches that are older congregations. They've done this a lot. They've had other pastors. So they're experienced, right? But here's the problem. They've also become settlers, and they just say, ho-hum, another change of pastors, we'll get through this. We want to change the culture to, we're going to grow through this. We have found that uh, older congregations that have had multiple pastoral changes today are having to deal with congregational fatigue. Church members, there are fewer people that have to do a lot more work. And coming out of all the issues that we've mentioned several times, people are just worn out. Can I get an amen? Is this true? So, look, we have discovered two great ways to re-energize a fatiguing church. So, one is put this stuff in their communion cups. No, not really. The second is to have a great passing of the baton, a great changeover zone. When you create this marker moment in the life of your church. And so we want to be sure that we're, you know, uh, uh, energizing our congregation. Now, here's the best way to get started. 
use the metaphor. Now, we met with your pastors yesterday, but I want to ask you folks, too, to understand how important it is that we have a visual way to talk about what's going on. Metaphor is just that. It's a visual way to help people get a handle on a more complex subject. Like Jesus was the master of metaphor, right? Why do you call them? Parables. And we know how important that is, but often when we're doing the most important thing in the church's life, a change of its leadership, we try to do it just with words. But words get confusing. So use the metaphor. Now, the metaphor that we use in our training and that we recommend as a good metaphor is the baton. It just naturally speaks uh, from one to the other. And passing the baton from your current pastor to the new pastor. Now, SPRC chairs, remember, your current pastor is not going to physically pass the baton to her or his successor because your current pastor will be gone. So the baton is passed through the SPRC chair. So on the first Sunday that your new pastor arrives, we're going to encourage you, SPRC chairs, either you or you get somebody who's good at speaking in public in front of people, to pass this baton physically and to rehearse all the places that this baton has gone, which we're getting ready to talk about. Use the metaphor. Now, some churches tell us, you know what? We don't want to use such an athletic metaphor. That's fine. Just be intentional about whatever metaphor you might want to use. We're working with one church uh, right now, actually a, a, a church in Virginia, and uh, they had a pastoral change a couple of years ago during COVID. They, were, they didn't like the way they could try to do passing the baton. And so they came up with the metaphor of a candle. It was so cool. COVID, nobody could come to church, but every church member received a candle in the mail at the same time at the same service in an evening. Everyone lit their candle as they said hello to their new pastor. Use whatever metaphor fits you. We're working with another church right now, uh, in your, in, again, in your conference, and they chose not to use this metaphor, but a metaphor of, uh, th this is a planned succession, where the, an associate is moving up to become the senior pastor at Christ Church, and so uh, they're using the metaphor of, uh, of a cruise, of a, of a ship, and they're saying, uh, we're, uh, we're changing captains, but not changing the course. And they're using a captain's hat to actually hand the captain's hat to uh, Todd when he uh, move, moves into the senior leadership. Am I making sense? Another church we know of in Texas, they, uh, they use the metaphor of Elijah and Elisha, of the mantle. And they went online and they bought a great biblical mantle. And they use it every Sunday, like we're going to show you with the baton. They had people sign it and write notes on it. They gave it to the new pastor, and, and that mantle sits in a, in a special bookcase in the pastor's office today. And when that pastor leaves, whether it's five months or 25 years, they're going to use that same mantle and give it to the next pastor. Be intentional. Use the metaphor. Now, folks, even tonight while we're talking, look on your sheet. Keep that sheet in front of you, that, that action plan quadrant. If you think of something, just jot it down, a challenge, a goal an opportunity or a plan, because we want to get all of your thinking. I mean, I mean, God needs each one of you. You have something unique that you're giving to your church, and we want to leverage that. We want God to use it. Just be sure you get it to your SBRC chair. You can come up with your action plan, and your transition team can execute it. Here's the third bullet. If you're filling in the blanks, our friends, rally around prayer. Prayer. Can we all agree that none of us is smart enough to do this by ourselves. If this is not completely immersed in prayer, it will be a very hard time. So rally around prayer. Now, again, we don't know your church. So some churches like to say, you know what, let's do, let's do a three weeks where everybody meets on the same Wednesday night and we do a, a, a prayer time, a prayer vigil for our new pastor, for our pastor we're saying goodbye to, for their families, for the community. Other churches say, we don't want to do that. Let's just do uh, things uh, virtually. 
uh, one church that we are working with in Georgia, and we and we put uh, it's in your resource and your workbook. Just look back there, and you'll see. Uh, this uh, church, I think, is, uh, the, is, is Mulberry Street uh, Methodist Church, and their address is 613. And so uh, you'll see the sheet. They gave everybody in their congregation specific things to pray for. And they said, every morning or every evening at 613, would you stop what you're doing and pray for passing the baton? Am I making sense? Now, um, again, use that draft. As Jim put up there, you have just six weeks. Which weeks are you going to focus on prayer? Which weeks are you going to have a video of your new pastor? And through filling in the blanks, Bible study. Dear friends, let's remember who we are. And we are a people of the word. So uh, we recommend that you come up with some Bible study. Now, in our book, The Changeover Zone, I don't know if you've received that or if your conference provides it, but you can get it online easily at Amazon. We have an outline of a Bible study. You can go online if somebody's good at that, and you can find lots of Bible studies on um, uh, succession in the, in the Bible, from Elijah to Elisha, you know, for, or, or many other uh, great ones. Again, we don't know your culture, your setup. Some churches say, let's ask every small group in every Sunday school class to do the same Bible study on the same Sunday or Sundays. Other churches, you've got good creative people, you write your own. But be sure that we're including Bible study. So that graph, those six Sundays, which Sundays are you going to focus on Bible study? That's one of the reasons this is a great opportunity for you. Our churches often, without us knowing it, we're so weary, we become settled in our prayer life and our Bible study life. This gives you a reason to reignite the very basis of what every church should be about. Can I get an amen? Let's don't waste this opportunity. And to highlight your identity, your identity. The last thing you want is to wait around for a new preacher to come and tell you who you are. You know who you are. Highlight your identity. Have every Sunday or some Sundays in that changeover zone, when somebody makes an announcement, be the pastor or you or some other volunteer, just coach them all to say, this is why we exist. So when the announcement's made, hey, we're going to collect shoes for the homeless shelter next Thursday, that's a great announcement. It's a great thing. Just add to it, this is why we exist, to help those in need. While there's a change of leadership, a church can become fragile. And so you want to be sure that you're solid and structurally clear about your prayer life, your Bible study life, and your identity. Am I making sense? Here is another great way to highlight identity. And I'm going to show you a couple of video examples. I'd encourage you, your folks that right now, with your team in your church, get together and either make a couple of very short videos where one of you is speaking and say, hey, this is what I love about our church, or this is what I recommend about the church. Now, these videos, they, should, they don't cost any money. You just do them with your cell phone. Don't spend any time. A video like this shouldn't last more than 15 to 20 seconds. You're not asking somebody to do five minutes. Very short. But when first-time guests see you, telling your story, that registers with them. Because I had to tell your preachers just yesterday, you know, I'm sure you're gonna, I'm sure your new preacher is gonna be a great preacher, but anybody can hear a great sermon anytime they want. They just download some famous preacher. Anybody can hear great music, great Christian music, anytime they want. They don't come, need to come to church to hear great music anymore. The one thing that they can't download is you, the people. The experience they have with you, your hospitality, your smile, your positive attitude, your overcoming attitude. Dear friends, don't miss this opportunity to leverage who you are to grow. Take a look. This is a young lady I met in a church in Georgia, I think. And uh, I just asked her, what got you to this church for the first time? And when she told me, I asked her politely if I could make a video of it, if she'd tell me the same thing. I got out my cell phone, made this short video. Within, as soon as she finished, we sent it to the 14-year-old volunteer at the Sound and Light Board. He took that little video that I sent as a text, turned it into this video, took no time, no effort, 
the pastor showed it during worship that, that morning, and I'll tell you what he did with it. Take a look. Okay, we started coming to the bridge um, probably in the spring of 2013 because we had some friends that were coming here, and we heard some good things about the church, and we just decided to give it a try, and it's been a good fit for our family. Hey, princess! Now, come on, that's a sweet video, and I love that. Hey, princess, see how personal, how lively it is? And when a first-time guest sees you loving the church, that means a lot. And I don't know if you picked up on this, but the reason she came to this church for the first time is she had friends talking about the church. Your friends, if you want to grow your church, talk about it wherever you go. Just talk about it. So when a church begins to settle and have settler behavior, people quit talking about their church except in meetings in their church. They don't talk about it outside. So don't miss this opportunity. Now, here's another question. If you all just sit together, you can do it tonight before if you're a group, but your next meeting, put, call a meeting of your SPR, your transition team, this week. Call it quick. Make a few of these videos. Here's a great one. Just ask each other. Just sit across from the table with your cell phone and ask, what would you recommend about our church? Make a short video clip. It's, it's easy, easy to turn it into a video on the screen. This is a young man in uh, Minneapolis that I asked, what would you recommend about your church? This is what I would recommend about our church. Uh, we, um, we have a very interactive atmosphere where it isn't just coming and listening to somebody speak at you, but you're able to tackle the topics of the day and the questions and doubts that you have with one another in a setting that is um, friendly and, and conducive to doing that. So um, I really enjoy that about our church. See how simple, how short, easy to do. People can see themselves on that screen. And incidentally, when people say on a screen, this is what I recommend about the church, about our church, it begins to teach people and to acculturate people to recommend their church to friends. Am I making sense? It's good stuff, huh? Okay. Here's the next R. Recruit eager people. Now, this is a great opportunity to recruit new people. Almost every church I work with says we can't recruit new people. One of the reasons is that you have had, and almost everybody in a church has had that experience where you were asked, hey, the third grade Sunday school teacher is going on vacation for two weeks. Would you teach those two weeks? 37 years later, you're still teaching the second grade Sunday school class. People don't trust being recruited because things never end. But this is short term. This is 146 days. So you can recruit eager people. And you recruit eager people by, first of all, making it fun. So, for instance, have you stand up one Sunday, mark it on that seat, on that graph. Jim, put the graph back up there for a second. Please. Thank you, sir. Pick which Sundays. So take a Sunday and just say to folks, you know, um, here's those six Sundays. So if, if all you have are videos of your pastor who's a coming, a first time guest may well get the impression and you may teach yourselves the impression that we are pastor centric. That's why we want to ask you to have lay videos so people don't think it's all about the pastor. It's about the church. Which of those Sundays, put them by dates. Are you going to have videos of pastor, videos of lay folks, videos of uh, have people sharing uh, the baton, and um, uh, and and you want to be sure that you're you know having fun with this. So one of those Sundays, um, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, one of those Sundays, actively recruit new people. So you know we want to we want to send our pastor off with great memories of this church. Is there anybody here that's that really this morning that likes to, that's good at scrapbooking, would you help us out? If, if we get pictures to you, could you put together a great scrapbook? And there may be a person out there that's done nothing else in the life of the church, but it will say, I could do that. And then you have a goodbye gift of great memories. Friends, um, don't waste these weeks. Remember, we're going to ask your pastor. I would recommend this Sunday for your pastor to stand up with the baton in worship and say, we're in the changeover zone. And soon I'll be passing the baton of leadership to my successor. And uh, let's be in prayer 
for our new pastor. Let's be in prayer. Let's put it on the altar. Some churches, COVID permitting, they actually pass the baton through the worship crowd and ask people to touch it. Have a hand in it. Let's have everybody in the church have a hand in passing this baton. Just imagine if the second Sunday, you had somebody from your children's ministry stand up and hold that baton and say, uh, this, this Sunday while we're in worship, I'll be taking the baton down to the children's area. And we're going to let every child who's able to just touch the baton, to have a hand on it. And we'll be explaining to them that the pastor that they've grown to know and love will be leaving and going somewhere else. And a new pastor will be coming. I can tell you, if you're a first-time guest and you have children, your heart's battering. What a kind, thoughtful group of people these are. Or imagine if one third Sunday, somebody stands up with that baton and they say, this, this week, we put together a team of people and we're going to take this baton to every shut-in in the church. Those people whose lives built this congregation, who often now are forgotten about and overlooked. And we're going to ask them if they're able to touch the baton. We're going to explain to them personally what's going on. I want to tell you, friends, if you have a first-time guest that Sunday and they hear you and they have an aging parent or a grandparent, their heart is pounding. What a kind, thoughtful group of people these are. Dear friends, that's how churches grow. So in that opportunity section, take a moment. What are the constituency groups? We have one pastor we work with. She's so brilliant. She takes the baton with her to every hospital visit, not only to have the patient touch it or to see it, but to explain to every technician, every nurse, every physician that comes in, no matter who they are. You know, healing ministry is such an important part of what we do at our church. And we're, we're in the changeover zone. We're having a change of pastors. Would, would you have a hand in this because the hospital means so much. We have people that take the baton to the Chamber of Commerce meeting and say to the con whole to Chamber of Commerce that, you know, we're having a pass in the baton, we're getting a new pastor. Would, would you just pass the baton amongst yourselves while you're having lunch? Because the community is so important. Am I making sense, friends? Here's what we tell church at this point. Look at me, please. Go crazy. You have better, few better opportunities just to be so creative. What are six or seven or eight or nine or 10 constituency groups that might hold that baton up? Or if you're using a different metaphor, use that metaphor. But we want to get as many people involved as we can. We want to recruit eager people. Make it fun. That church I mentioned to you in, in Virginia, so uh, to say goodbye to their, uh, their retiring pastor, they're using the metaphor of a ship and the captain's hat. So they're building a little uh, frame of a, of a ship. If you've ever been on a cruise or something where you can get your picture taken with the exiting pastor before he leaves. And uh, you'll have a memory and he'll have a memory of you. Make it fun. Do things together. Think about what can we do to say goodbye to our pastor that will be a marker moment in that pastor's life, but even more importantly for our church. Now. We ask you, go crazy. Uh, you maybe have already made your exit plans for your pastor who's leaving. But if you haven't, you know, to come up with something that's really fun that people are doing together, that are, people are laughing about. And I, I can assure you, if you do nothing, except on your pastor's last Sunday, stand up and clap for her or him, your pastor is going to leave with great memories of you. If you do nothing, for your new pastor, except cookies and punch on uh, her, his first Sunday, I can tell you, your new pastor is a professional. They're going to give you 110%. We want to be extravagant and thoughtful and courteous, not for them, but for a first time guest. We want them to see you and say, what a great group of people these are. How thoughtful. Make it familiar. Uh, just remember, do things that people can relate to. Almost every layperson in you, you know, like you get folks, if you've gone through job changes, you've had bosses that have come and gone, you've been a boss that's come and gone, and you want people to compare their work life experience with the church life experience and compare it favorably. You don't want somebody saying, you know what, um, 
our pastor has been here 14 years and all they're doing is saying, you know, a meager thank you. And when I was in the business world, when I left after 10 years, they did this and this. You want to compare how great you are and consider it you are. Make it unforgettable. Memories, thanks. Some churches will create a special thanks uh, depending on where your pastor is going next. And maybe a stole or a special kind of a Bible that you have written in or other cool things. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, do thanks for your ex exiting pastor that really express thank you and do it publicly. Everything you do, you want to do publicly. The same with saying hello to your new pastor. You've only got six weeks left. Pick a couple of weeks for, as an example in which uh, you find out who your new pastor is, a little bit about the new pastor. And outside your worship setting, uh, you put on tables uh, greeting cards and you ask everybody to come in the, in the church to sign one of the greeting cards and you compile these greeting car cards and you send it to your new pastor and their family before they ever arrive. Just to say, we can't wait to have you. Here's our new pastor. Am I making sense? You go crazy. You come up with ways. What are going to be marker moments? Saying goodbye to your current pastor to consider their needs. We have one pastor who uh, spent a whole ministry career in ministry, never owned a home, retired, is going on to a new house. And people thought about that. And somebody was thoughtful enough to give him a lawnmower as a going away gift, one of the Sunday school classes because of its, the needs they have. So go crazy. You know, what's your situation? Re-energize the congregation. Remember, it's not just about a smooth and seamless transition, but to accelerate growth in the life of your church. Now, friends, uh, I am a pastor. I'm a retired pastor. Uh, so I've been through a number of moves and, and I'm speaking from a pastoral voice. Um, and, but we have a number of our of lay folks that work on our team and, and they're on vacation right now or they'd, they'd share right now this from a laity standpoint. It's part of the job of laity to reorient around a new leader. It's going to have a different voice, a different style, and it's a give and take, but do your best to reorient around them. Give them grace. Try to minimize the number of times, well, we don't do it that way, is said. Reorient around a new leader. And that last R is, hey, if you've got other staff members, even if they're part-time, remember them publicly. If you've got a part-time youth minister, bring them up on Sunday morning or do a video of them to show on Sunday morning where you're giving him tickets to movies or something like that to say thank you. Not for them, but for who? Yeah, all right, that first time guest. You want people to say, these are the kind of people I can hang out with. And your other staff will appreciate it. In most church settings, staff members, part-time or full-time during a transition work twice as hard. And they have a lot of anxiety. They're getting a new boss. Will the boss fire them? Will they change everything? There's a lot of anxiety. So shower love and affirmation. Am I making sense? Now, I've just given you examples. Uh, if you follow up with a consultation, we'll be glad to work with you more. But hey, I know you're all creative lay folks. Go crazy. Just be intentional. Write these things down. Get with each other. Don't let this slip. You may decide. You're only going to have one video of your pastor, a new pastor. Make it intentional. Don't be a situation where, oh, we just forgot to do another one. Am I making sense? Be intentional. Now, we've been talking about the inboarding phase and the saying goodbye phase. We want to land this baby. Jim's great at this. We're talking about the onboarding. After your new pastor gets here, how does that pastor get onboarded? and become your new pastor. Jim, take it away, please. All right. Uh, so if you look on page seven in your workbook, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the listening tour. And uh, we hear all the time uh, from pastors who have gone to new appointments, and they say the most important thing uh, that I was able to do in those first 100 days was uh, go on the listening tour and to hear uh, from people in the congregation. Now, uh, this is going to take place when your new pastor arrives after July 3rd, but you need to be planning it now. You've got those 46 days. 
uh, because you want this to be organized before they get there. Now, the listening tour is a, a series of small group gatherings uh, where uh, people come together and it gives the pastor the opportunity to hear from people in the church. And we met with the pastors yesterday and we made it you know, really clear to them, uh, this is a listening tour and it is about the pastor listening to you and listening to uh, the uh, other people in the church. There are lots of opportunities for the, the pastor to share uh, her story, his story, uh, but this is about the pastor listening. And uh, we really do recommend that you use the language, uh, the listening tour, uh, instead of something like meet and greet or chat and chew, uh, because uh, you know, we, we want to build that culture of uh, listening. Now, I said it's a series of small group gatherings. You may be wondering, well, you know, how many of those do we need to have? Uh, a general rule of thumb is to take your average worship attendance and divide that by 10. So whatever your average worship attendance is, divide that by 10. And that's a, a good general rule of thumb. Uh, some churches say, hey, you know, we want uh, fewer than that in these or more than that. Uh, but uh, that's, that's a good uh, general rule of, of thumb. Um, now, you see in your workbook, there's some key roles uh, because uh, this isn't really complicated, uh, but uh, there are some moving parts. And so you want to make sure that you're intentional about uh, paying attention to these uh, details. And it's really good uh, to have uh, people who are in these key roles, uh, someone who is the, the coordinator. Uh, who's going to uh, oversee uh, all the moving parts, make sure that you know, things are scheduled and things are, are communicated. Um, again, you're planning this before your new pastor arrives. Uh, now, of course, you need to be in communication with them about the dates and times that you're looking at uh, so that you make sure that that's going to work with their schedule. Uh, but uh, somebody's going to be uh, the coordinator and then uh, someone uh, to be uh, in charge of the communication for this because you want to make this a big deal. You know, this isn't something you want to just talk about once or print in the bulletin and hope people see it. You know, you really want to encourage people to uh, come to one of these listening to her uh, gatherings. Uh, the more people who are there, uh, the better it is. Uh, hosts. And this is a great opportunity to involve somebody who may not be like really involved in your church now, um, you know, but you, you ask them, hey, would you be willing to host uh, one of these gatherings in your homes? Now, we believe ideally uh, these uh, work best uh, when they're held in, in people's homes. Um, now, you know, we've mentioned COVID a few times and uh, this meeting tonight, we know we're all dealing with that. And you know, given uh, the protocols uh, where you live, uh, that may not be practical. Uh, don't think you can't do this if you can't meet in people's homes, because you can. The last couple of years, we've had churches who have conducted the entire listening tour online on Zoom, like we're uh, doing tonight. You know, sometimes the church uh, says, hey, we can do some in some homes, but uh, we'll do a couple uh, in, the, in the church building. It can still work, okay? Um, you know, but ideally, we think uh, people's homes is the best. You know, we know that's just a more intimate uh, setting, um, and it, it, it gives you another opportunity to uh, engage somebody in your church to invite them to be a host. And then this is really important. You want for every one of these listening to our meetings uh, to have someone who is present as a scribe who's going to take notes, uh, because we're going to talk in a, a few minutes about the questions that people are going to be responding to. And you want your pastor to be able to really be engaged in listening uh, to what people are saying and not trying to you know, jot down notes and listen at the same time. Uh, so you have somebody who's there uh, who's you know, already assigned to be uh, the scribe. And then uh, it's also a great idea for each one of these to have somebody who's like an Uber driver, uh, somebody from your church who's going to go and pick up uh, your, your pastor from their home and drive them to uh, this listening tour meeting. And it's an opportunity for relationship building. And it also takes um, you know, a little stress out of uh, the experience for them. They're not having to worry about how to navigate uh, a community that they're not yet uh, familiar with. 
Um, so what happens when you do these listening to her gatherings, the end result is your pastor has heard from so many people in your congregation, and now your pastor is able in, in a short period of time to learn so much about the story of your church, uh, uh, about the culture of your church, and your pastor is able to weave into things like their Sunday messages. Here's what I heard on the listening tour. You know, and, and conversations with uh, people in the church and outside the church. You know, here's what I heard over and over. And, and it really creates that culture of listening. So uh, look at that checklist in, in the middle. This is organized now, uh, but it's uh, going to be conducted when your new pastor uh, arrives. Uh, have those leaders in place, those key roles um, you know, have the drivers and scribes uh, arranged ahead of time. If you can do it in homes and have dessert, uh, that's that's great. Um, now, how do you organize people into these groups? Churches do it in different ways. Some churches will take, well, you know, we've got existing small groups or ministry groups or, um, you know, ministry teams, and we'll just make that our, our groups. Uh, other churches uh, say, hey, we're going to take more of a geographic approach, and we're going to organize people around neighborhoods. Uh, other churches will do it in a more uh, random way where, you know, we're going to have eight of these, and we'll let people sign up for which one uh, they want to go to. Uh, there's no one right way to do this. Um, in our experience, um, we have found that we have a preferred way. Uh, and that's uh, to not use existing groups. Um, and, and here's why. Uh, because, you know, if you have Sunday school classes that have been together for 10 years, 15 years, whatever, you know, those relationships are already, you know, well formed. And a lot of times in those uh, types of already existing groups, you know, there's one or two, one or two people who, you know, just will kind of dominate the, the conversation. Um, and uh, again, this isn't a universal rule, but our experience has been, uh, you'll usually have better results if you don't, you know, just go with, hey, we're going to use our uh, existing group with your know, organized people uh, geographically or in some other way. And that gives people the opportunity to, um, you know, be able to build relationships with people that they may not know that well. Now, the questions that you have for the listening tour that people are going to be responding to. Uh, you wanna make sure that uh, they have those ahead of time. And on page 19 in uh, the workbook, you'll find a sample invitation letter as well as a sample confirmation letter. And, and so people have the questions ahead of time, but also have those questions uh, printed on something like a three by five card at the listening tour meeting. And that way, you know, people who maybe they didn't bring the questions with them or someone who is more shy and doesn't want to uh, speak up, they can uh, use that card and, and write things on it and still be a part of this. Um, and, and there are three questions. And um, we really, really recommend that you use th these three questions uh, because we've just seen over and over and over again that these three questions make the listening tour just an awesome uh, and, and impactful experience uh, that you know, lasts long beyond uh, the meetings themselves. So here are the three questions, okay? People have them ahead of time. They also have a three by five card and uh, you focus on these three questions. The first one is this, what is one thing that I, as the new pastor, need to know about this congregation? And then everybody who's present uh, is able to respond to that question. What is one thing that I, as the new pastor, need to know about this congregation? The second question is, what is one way that we are going to reach new people in this area? And just look at the wording of that. I mean, this is intentional wording. What is one way that we, you know, we are in this together? And what are we in together? We are about reaching new people in this area. You know, what is one way that we're going to reach new people in this area? And then the third is this. What is one dream that you have for our church? 
Okay. And so you have these listening tour gatherings. Everybody has the same uh, three questions. And then your pastor is able to hear from, uh, you know, as many people as possible, hopefully everybody who's a, a part of your church. And then your pastor is able to, you know, know in their heart and being a, is able to say, here's what I heard on the listening tour. And they've learned about the story and the culture of your church and the dreams uh, that people have. Again, uh, this is, we hear it from pastors, this is what so many say, the most impactful thing that they do in those first 100 days. And so for it to be the experience that it can be, you need to be planning it and organizing it, communicating it, publicizing it now uh, so that uh, it can be conducted in a great way after your new pastor arrives. Now, now we're going to switch to a, a different topic here in just a second. But Jim, before we do, um, anything you'd add? Yeah, thanks, Jim. So let me summarize. Uh, um, in the next six Sundays, be intentional. What, how are you going to set a culture of growth in the church? Use the baton or your metaphor. Just get specific, whatever, whatever it is. If you're using the baton or whatever your metaphor, remember that on your new pastor's first Sunday, you're probably going to do other things. Churches do special things on that first Sunday uh, that they're with you. Um, but please, uh, SPR chairs, you'll be the one handing the new pastor the baton or the metaphor. And you rehearse everything that's done. You say, because on that first Sunday, you're going to have curiosity seekers. Now, your first Sunday is July 3rd. So um, that, that holiday weekend may make it tougher. So you may want to do some of this on week two. Uh, but, it, you know, your culture, but rehearse it. So, Pastor, we, as we give you this baton, we just want you to know that every child has had a chance to have a hand on it. And you'll see notes, maybe in the children's department, the kids have done little handprint notes that you've rolled up or scrolled up and put in the baton. You, this baton has been to every shut-in. This baton has been in our community. It's, you got the idea? When you rehearse it, everybody there, those curiosity seekers, this is a hard moment for them. How thoughtful. What a courteous group of people. So um, plan goodbye in great ways. We've talked talk with your pastors about their role in saying goodbye. Do remember, my friends, if your current pastor doesn't let go of the baton, your new pastor has very little chance of being successful. And we shared with that with them yesterday. But remember, dear friends, if you don't let go of the baton, your new pastor has very chance, little chance to be successful. So let go and let God create a new future in the life of your church. Now, we believe you can have a great changeover zone and a passing of the baton. But no matter how good it is, when there's a change of leadership in any organization, there are often some losses. So we want to close in the next 10 minutes and share with you uh, the six reasons that some people may leave during the transition and six reasons that new people will surface. We share this with you because, friends, don't panic if you look around and you see somebody that you've known and gotten used to seeing in a certain seat in the worship setting if they are not there. Because uh, as Jim is going to share with you, has often has very little to do with the new pastor. But if you panic and you, uh, you just immediately start saying to each other and yourself, hey, this isn't working, you create a self-fulfilling prop prophecy. Am I making sense? So be grace-filled. Uh, we're going uh, to run maybe five minutes late. I hope that's okay. But I think you'll find this really helpful for you to know. Jim, take off. Okay. Uh, page eight in your workbooks. Uh, we're going to talk about some reasons that people leave. And look at those first two words. Uh, it says, don't panic. OK, but let, we want to uh, have an understanding of this. So let's look at uh, the six reasons. One uh, we call breakaways, breakaways. And these are people who have um, you know, been at the church for a long time. They've been working hard 
uh, but they just need a break. And a lot of these people have been really looking for an opportunity uh, to, to break away for a while. And the transition uh, can uh, provide that for them. Um, you know, they were going to leave regardless, uh, but now there's this time of transition. And so, hey, I can just uh, break away. And, you know, we just need to understand that these breakaways, and we tell this to the pastors, it has nothing to do with them as the new pastor. Uh, these folks were looking to break away anyway. And we often see this uh, with people who, you know, the, your neighbors, you, they love you, they, they love the church. They had their babies there, their babies were loved by the church, but when their babies turn into teenagers and the hot youth group is at a church down the street, that's where they're going to go. And they often take their parents. And because any parent today is going to go where their church kid wants to go to church. So th th we often see that kind of a dynamic, nothing to do with anything. They just need a break. Yeah. Uh, second, is pushed away. Uh, pushed away. And these can be uh, people who are upset by the way the transition was handled. Uh, they also may have been looking for an excuse uh, to leave, or maybe if just for whatever reason, they just you know, immediately just didn't uh, like the new, new pastor. And uh, when we talk to somebody who's a pushed away, uh, they'll say something like this, we didn't leave the church, the church left us. Okay, those are pushed aways. Uh, third is step aways. Step aways. And uh, these folks will stay uh, through the immediate uh, transition, but you know, as uh, you know, a little time passes, they just can't get over the fact that the, the new pastor isn't the, pa the pastor that they uh, love so much. And you know, within a, a year, uh, they'll step away, and sometimes they'll say something like, you know, we're just going to step away, and we'll see how things shake out, okay? Now, uh, number two and number three, uh, pushed aways and step aways. Uh, this next term is not number four. Uh, you can kind of write this one in the, the margin and draw an arrow from two and three and write takeaways, because uh, a lot of times pushed aways and step aways uh, can also be takeaways, which means when they leave, uh, because of relationships that they've uh, had, uh, there may be some others uh, who uh, will go with them. All right, number number four are slipaways, slipaways, and uh, these are, are people who are kind of neutral about the the pastoral change, uh, but you know, just over a little bit of time, the new pastor doesn't connect with them for whatever reason. Uh, so uh, they will just slip away. And you know, a lot of times you can see some signs of this uh, before it actually happens. You know, a person who's been really engaged and then they just, you know, are dialing that uh, back. You know, they're, they're not engaged as much. You know, they're not contributing as much. And then, you know, they just slip away. Number five is fadeaways. And uh, these can be really painful. Uh, because uh, they'll stick around for a year, maybe even two. But then the church dynamics uh, start to, to change. And uh, let me ask uh, for a show of hands right now. If you would like to see your church grow, uh, would you just lift your hand up? Okay, I don't see anyone without their hand lifted up. Um, look at me for a second, because... This is true. When your church grows, the dynamics of your church will change. That's just going to happen. You know, when things grow, the dynamics change. And sometimes, you know, when that happens, there's some people who you know, they're just not happy with how the dynamics have changed. And a fadeaway, uh, when they're gone, they'll say something like this. This just isn't the same church that I joined. Again, these can be really painful because they didn't leave in the early days. You know, they stick around for a, a couple of years. And then number six are stowaways. Um, and these are folks who, uh, you know, hang around in, in the background, not really, you know, uh, contributing in, in ways. And then, uh, you know, over time, uh, their uh, stowaway becomes a go away. Now, uh, this, this next part is really important for me to say, and it's really important uh, for us to hear 
Uh, just warn you a little bit, it may be a little bit disappointing in the moment uh, for you to hear this, uh, but uh, here's the experience that a lot of new pastors have. And I pastored for 29 years. Uh, I had this happen to me. Uh, I think it was my first or second day in a new appointment. Uh, someone came up to me with a big smile on their face, uh, welcomed me, and they had a piece of paper in their hand handed it to me and there was printing on the front side and back and listed on that piece of paper were all the names of all the people who had left the church, you know, over the past year, five years, 10 years, whatever. And I don't remember the exact words, uh, but what I heard was this, go get them. And, and that the hope and the expectation was that, you know, I would go out and bring all of those people back. And so, you know, the question that we get a lot of times is how much energy should a new pastor put into trying to bring back people who have left? And the way that we answer it is this, a little, but not a lot. A little, but not a lot. You're sending out some communication that's, you know, celebrating your new pastor's arrival. Should those people be included on the email list or the mail list? Absolutely. But churches who do something like we're going to put together a shepherding team and we're going to go out and we're going to visit everybody who has left and tried to bring them back. Um, usually, I mean, almost always, what that produces is just uh, frustration and disillusionment. That time and energy is much better invested and much more fruitfully invested in trying to reach new people in your community. Okay. How much time and energy do you put into that? A little, but not a lot. Okay, Jim? Now, the good news is there'll be new people that will show up. Now, the first group are called show-ups. I'm on page nine. So show-ups are just the curiosity seekers. Uh, many of you know Jim Chandler. He was an excellent pastor in your conference for many years in several settings. But I can tell you, no matter how good a pastor Jim was, there were just some people that didn't connect with him. That every pastor knows that. And so, uh, but when there's a new pastor, people will often just show up just to check out the new pastor and see what's going on. Especially now, my friends, people are starting to come out of COVID. They're starting to want to reconnect physically with people. Perhaps you've seen the recent research that today, more unchurched people are, are willing to try a, a United Methodist congregation than ever before. This is a great, you're going to have some curiosity seekers. So be ready week one and beyond. The reason we want you to start publicizing the listening tour now is so that people will see that you are planning ahead beyond the first Sunday. This isn't just a one Sunday event. We use a philosophy my mama taught me. It's easier to pull a rope than push a rope. We want to pull people into the new future by good vision, good planning, things out there that they can look forward to because they're going to show up. And we want to be sure that when they show up, they have reason to come back. Number two are step ups. I love step ups as a pastor, spiritually mature people often in the fields of, uh, uh, you know, in a professional field or education or something like that. And they just intuitively know that when there's a change of leadership at the top of any organization, other people have got to step up to fill in the slack and make it work. Move ups uh, are uh, great folks. These are people that have started moving into some church leadership. They've gotten on fire. They've got, somebody's gotten involved with a church service project or a Bible study or discipleship study, and, and they started to move in, but now when there's a change of pastors, they don't stop, but intuitively they say, you know, let's get in on the ground floor of this next chapter of our church, and so they will move up. Now, be aware, as Jim mentioned earlier, if a pastor and a church is successful and new people start coming, and a few new people start getting on committees and teams, it can threaten the existing structure and cause, cause some disharmony in the church. So it's the curse of success. Grow ups are my favorite personally. These are young people. These are people at any age who are young in their faith. And um, they, um, 
uh, they've gotten it started in something, they, they've been in some kind of intentional, maybe they've joined a Sunday school class, they've made some friends and connections, uh, and now they grow up with a change of leadership. They'll say, you know what, it, this really wasn't the church of our former pastor. It's not the pastor's church, it's who's, it's our church, and they grow up into more responsibility. We call them making disciples. It's a blessing. Your pastor will just be on cloud nine watching grow up surface in the life of your church. Ramp ups are those people. Yeah, every church has them. You know, when the doors open, they're there. They're doing something. They're worker bees. But when there's a new pastor, that worker bee has an opportunity to get involved in a different way on the ground floor again of this new a new exciting era of the church. And so they ramp up their involvement more into leadership and will help train others based on their experience. And this last group we call climb ups. My writing partner is from the East. He actually says this a little rougher than me. He calls these suck ups. And that's just what they are. When the, when the new pastor arrives, uh, my friends, they will be there at the door. They'll help unload the books. They're gonna act so friendly, but really they have an agenda about some issue in the life of the church, the color of the carpet or where the Coke machine goes or the youth minute, they've got some agenda. And we coached your pastors yesterday. We said, you can almost always tell a ramp, a, a, a climb up because they're going to scoot right up close to you and they're going to say something like, now that you're here, now, you know, they've got their agenda. My closing word, don't be that climb up person. All right, friends, this has been fun for us. I hope it's been helpful for you. And uh, anything we can do, we'd like to help with. If you don't mind, I, I know we're out of time. So I'm going to ask uh, while I'm setting up the last thing, uh, Dwayne, if there are any specific questions we need to address. If not, we always show this video, whatever we present, it just reminds us of who we are as uh, uh, presenters and who we are as a church. And if you'll just um, join in with this, we think you'll be blessed. Friends, uh, Jim and I are so thankful that we've had the opportunity to uh, spend a little time with you tonight. And, and you know, we, we just want you to know we're in your corner and we're cheering you on. And our prayer is that you'll have an amazing time in the changeover zone to share God's amazing grace. Amen. Amen.